Would you kindly open your copy of God's infallible word or that of the copy found in the pew in front of you to the Gospel of John chapter 21. And I will be reading various verses from John chapter 21 as we move along. So keep your Bible open, please, and follow along with me when it comes time to read. Let's ask the Lord to bless us with understanding. Heavenly Father, we have sung with our voices praises to your name, and now we come with open hearts, open minds, to be touched afresh by the Holy Spirit. Take, a, take your word, we humbly ask, and quicken it. Make it alive in our minds and our hearts. Use your word to penetrate our very hearts like a two-edged sword, bringing anyone to salvation in need of Jesus Christ today, edifying your children in and through Christ and your word in a life-blessed way. We commend ourselves to your tender watch care for your will to be done and unfolded before us. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory that you alone so richly deserve as we humbly offer this prayer by faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the King of Kings. Amen. Now, unless you were living last Sunday in a cave somewhere deep beneath the surface of the earth. You know that last Sunday we joined Christians around the world to celebrate the truth that Jesus Christ did not come out of that grave in a spirit but in body forevermore to live and come again for us. In biblical days, in the New Testament, initially they worshipped on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. And then, once Jesus Christ arose from the grave on Sunday, the Christians in the New Testament days began to gather to worship on Sunday. And every time they did that, they celebrated our Savior's resurrection, not just once a year as we now do. There's something else that goes on in our great land in the call America on Easter Sunday or Easter weekend, and that is Easter parades. Atlantic City has a big one on the boardwalk. Philadelphia has an Easter parade. New York City has a gigantic Easter parade every year. Other parades, Easter parades are held throughout our country. And they involve floats and bands and Easter bunnies and people dress up in all manner of uh, fine clothes. But after those parades are over, then they go back to their daily lives. And I wonder, after we celebrate as believers our resurrected Lord, whether after that's all over, we just go back to our regular lives. In Russia today, to this day, for years this has been going on, there's what I think is a really neat tradition, and that is Christians gather together in homes or in their local churches, and they have a party on the Monday after Easter. And uh, during that gathering, they have lots of food, but they have funny skits, and then they tell jokes. And the purpose of it all is to remind them that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and was put into that grave, Satan thought he was done with Jesus Christ, and God had the last laugh on him. That's pretty neat, isn't it? You need a joke right now. A little boy went to school. He had this massive bruise on his arm. 
His friend said, how in the world did you get that bruise on your arm? He said, by eating Easter candy. He said, his friend said, you can't get a bruise like that on your arm by eating Easter candy. He said, you can if it's your older brother's Easter candy. <laughs> well, God said, my son shall be put to death. We talk about unfairness in this life. I hear that everywhere we go. I go, it's unfair, it's unfair, it's unfair. God never, never, never get it through our heads. He never said life would be fair. It can't be fair because we're sinners. And if there's any proof of that, Jesus Christ was unfairly arrested unfairly judged, unfairly crucified because he committed no sins, but he rose again from the grave, just like God said he would. But what should life be like now after Easter celebration? Nick Stengel gave me this great joke. And I'm going, I, I just love it. It's about a husband and his ever-nagging wife. Now, ladies, don't send me any emails. So, you know, it's a joke, all right? But this husband and his ever-nagging wife went to Jerusalem to visit the Holy Land. And uh, while they were there, his ever-nagging wife suddenly died. And so he contacted the local undertaker, and the undertaker said to the man, well, sir, um, we can, I can ship the body back to the United States for burial, but it'll cost $5,000. Or for $150, I can have her nicely buried here in Jerusalem. And so it's your, it's your choice. And so he thought for a moment, he said, now, ship her back into the United States, and we'll bury her there. And he said, well, you understand, it's going to cost $5,000 to do that. For $150, we could bury her right now, right, right, right here. He said, well, I know long ago that a man died here, was buried here, and three days later he rose again from the dead, <laughs> and I just can't take that chance. Now, when Nick gave me this joke, I said, Nick, you need to understand the rules of pulpit humor. <laughs> if it's funny, I take credit for it. If it turns out to be a loser, you get the blame for it. So, at any rate, Nick, that was great. Great joke. But that's the excitement of our Christian faith. God's given us reason to laugh, to smile, to celebrate. At sporting events, we do that. People that aren't even fans of Flyers, all of a sudden are watching the Flyers. Yeah! I don't know what I'm cheering at, but yeah! Sixers are doing okay. Yeah! The Phillies. Yeah! You know, we have no. We ought to be doing that with our celeb our, resurre our Savior's resurrection. Well, here in John chapter 21, did the, what did the disciples do after his resurrection? They went fishing. John chapter 21, beginning of verse 1, after these days Jesus manifested himself, day in body, not in the spirit, again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. 
And he said to them, Cast the net on the right hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast. And then, when, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Now that is a true fish story. You know, you hear fishermen, they catch a fish like that, and by the time they get done telling the story, it was like some giant whale. <laughs> but here, that's what the scriptures say. So what do we learn from this as to what we're to do after we celebrate our Savior? Number one, God wants us to keep on obeying his word. Easter's over. Now let's not just get back to business as usual. We're to be living in a life-changing way in obeying his word. Verse 6. Our Savior said to them, cast your net over here, and they obeyed our Savior. That is a teaching that we have for our own lives. Obey God's word. People tell me, and they've told you all kinds of reasons why they don't come to Sunday school or church. And at the risk of offending, offending anyone, it's all an excuse. They don't want to come to Sunday school and they don't want to come to church. And so if we make something up, like the roof will fall in if I go to church, somehow it makes us feel less guilty. Well, here's ten reasons why I never wash. See if these don't sound a little familiar to you in reference to those who say they don't go to church or Sunday school anymore. Ten reasons why I never wash. I was forced to wash as a child. People who wash are hypocrites. They think they're cleaner than others. There are so many kinds of soap, I could never decide which one was right. I used to wash, but it got boring. I wash only on Christmas or Easter. None of my friends wash. I'll start washing when I'm older. I really don't have time to wash. The bathroom isn't warm enough to wash. People who make soap are only after your money. Come on, that was funny. But that's the kind of stuff people say. I, I, I don't go to church because I was forced to go to church as a child. Uh, I'll go to church when, uh, when I'm older. And, and they're 99 years That's when they say that. God says, I want you to go to Bible study. And I want you to come to church and worship me as often as you can. That's, a, that's not a suggestion. We need to obey God's word. Not just in that reference, but in all references. Satan wants us to pick and choose. So I like that. I'll obey that part. Oh, I don't like this part over here, so I won't obey that. God says, you celebrated my resurrect son's resurrection. Now continue to obey my word. Number two, keep trusting that God provides our every need. Keep trusting he provides our every need. In John chapter 21, verses 7 to 11, I've got to hasten here. Our Savior knew that the disciples were hungry. And so he made sure that they caught fish to feed them. God meets our every need. I love the story <clears throat> of the father who said to his son one freshly warm summer day, Son, let's go for a ride in the country and let's roll the windows down. Let the breeze blow through our hair. And so... They're driving down the country road, and a bee flew inside the car. And the, the boy was deathly allergic to bees, and he knew that if that bee stung him, he'd get very, very sick, maybe even die. So he began to panic and scream and holler. And the father very calmly pulled the car off the side of the road, waited for the opportune moment, 
fought that bee in his hand. The son could hear the bee buzzing away, and all of a sudden it stopped buzzing. And the son finally called, calmed down, and the father opened his hands and said, Son, you don't have to be afraid. I took this thing for you. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, that's exactly what God did for us. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Christ has taken the stinger for us. He has risen. Fear is gone. New life is ours. That's what we need to be celebrating. God has taken the sting. And if God has taken the sting out of death, don't you think he's going to provide all of our needs? Why in the world are believers wringing their hands as if we have no faith? Why are we allowing our hearts and our minds to get all befuddled over heartaches and problems and sorrows when we have faith? Our Savior's not dead. He's not in a grave. He's alive, and if he can do that, he will take care of us. Save it. Amen. 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 Come on, folks. Get alive. He's alive. Get alive. Don't just sit there and go, Amen. He's alive. He will provide your every need. Let's quit whining and moaning and groaning and get on with trusting. He's alive. Number three. God doesn't give up on us. Thank God he doesn't give up on us. He didn't give up on Peter. Verse 7 of John chapter 21. There's Peter, my man Peter. He's my buddy. Recognizes that it's the Lord and basically he's naked. Now that's the way fishermen did in, in biblical days. And he sees the Lord, and he's embarrassed. So he quits, puts some clothes on. You know why he's embarrassed? Because this is really the first time he's encountered the Lord resurrected. He's remembering the time when he denied knowing Jesus Christ. Do you understand? Do you really understand what he, what he did with that denial? He didn't just say, uh, no, I, I had, I've never met the guy. He literally denied ever hearing the name of Jesus Christ. That's denial. You remember the time when Jesus Christ was walking on the water? Peter wanted to come out. The Lord said, come on out, Peter. Peter's walking on top of that water. He's doing just fine until he took his eyes off of Jesus Christ and sank. That's what he's remembering. Now he's embarrassed. And so we read in verses 15 to 17, our Lord saying, Peter, 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 do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I do. Then tend my lamb. Peter, let me, let, me, let me make sure I understand you correctly. Do you love me? Verse 16. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then shepherd my sheep. Oh, Peter, just could I have your attention just for one more moment, please? Peter, I just want to make sure I heard you straight. Verse 17. Do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. Then tend my sheep. Restoration. When we fall flat on our faces and we mess up our lives and we sin against God, what Satan wants us to do is quit on God. Leave the church. Stop believing. Just get on with our lives. Do the best we can. That's what Satan wants. The Lord says, look, I know you messed up. You've confessed it. You've repented of it. Let's get on with living again. For living again your faith. Obeying, trusting, believing that he doesn't give up on us so that we don't give up on him. Number four, 
rely on, rely on God to keep giving us direction and guidance. Verse 10 of John chapter 21. He tells them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. He's giving them guidance. He's giving them direction. Do you remember when you were a child, people always asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? People are still asking me that question. Pastor, what do you want to do when you grow up? But at any rate, <coughs> you know, we have our own self-conceived plans. This is what we're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. God has a plan for each of us. And we need to rely on him to unfold that plan. And number five, know that God wants us to keep fishing. Chapter 21, verse 3 they said, we're going fishing. Luke chapter 5, a similar story about fishing, and they couldn't catch anything, and he kept, and the Lord said, try one more time. Now, please understand, what these, these are just not fish stories in the Bible, as if God had nothing else to do with his time, or he needed to say, well, that's a pretty big Bible. I better fill it up with some stories. It's all about fishing for souls. And that's what we need to do. God did not save us so that we keep our faith to ourselves. One man showed up to the Easter service. The pastor said to him, wow, good to see you. I haven't seen you since last Christmas. He said, yeah. He said, you know, you really need to get into the Lord's army. And the man said, I am in the Lord's army. He said, well, if you're in the Lord's army, how come you're only here Christmas and Easter? And he whispered, whispered to the pastor and said, I'm in the Lord's secret service. We're not in his secret service. Look at your own soul. Where would your soul be right now if you have Christ your Savior? Where would your soul be if someone didn't tell you about Jesus Christ? You'd be lost. You'd be bound for hell. Someone cared enough to tell you about Jesus Christ. We can't keep that to ourselves. We got to know that the Lord wants us to keep fishing. So although Easter's over, now it's not back to business as usual. Let's keep obeying his word. Let's keep trusting that he will provide our every need and quit all whining and groaning and moaning. Trust the Lord to meet our needs. Keep believing that he does not give up on us. And number four, rely on him giving us direction and guidance for our lives. <clears throat> number five, know that we are to keep fishing for the Lord for souls. William Sangster was a great preacher and evangelist during World War II. And I've read many of his sermons, and he really was a preacher of his day. Won many souls to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But in his older days, he developed cancer of the throat, and he lost the use of his voice. He couldn't even whisper. And his daughter, who was taking care of him, was with him one Easter morning when he wrote this note to her. Easter Sunday morning, he wrote, How terrible to wake up on Easter and have no voice to shout. He is risen. Far worse, to have a voice on Easter and not want to shout, he is risen. If you don't have Jesus Christ your Savior, you didn't want to shout, he is risen. You might have shouted it, but it didn't come from your heart. It just came from your head because somebody next to you said it. And I know I get criticized for giving invitations when I look out and I see people here that I know and uh, get over it. Be 
because only you know whether you've invited Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And so I always give that invitation that in while there's still time, if you've never invited Christ to be your Savior, now's the time to do it. So that you have a voice to shout, He is risen. And I invite you to invite Jesus Christ to be your Savior. This is why I conduct funerals for unchurched people. I get criticized about doing that too. Why do you do funerals for unchurched people? If they're not, they don't come to church, you shouldn't be doing funerals. Get over it. That's a mission field. That's me being able to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to a captive audience. Planting the seed of the gospel. And that's what you need to do. There's a neighbor that needs to hear about Jesus Christ. There's somebody that you work with that needs to hear about Jesus Christ. There's somebody who might be in your family. You've never told them about Jesus Christ. They might not even know that you're a believer. Now's the time to go fishing. So Easter's over with. And if the Lord tarries and we're still alive and Harry's in his return, we're still alive, then next year will be another Easter. But until then, let's leave this place saying, you know what? Now's the time for me as a believer to keep obeying, keep trusting, keep believing, keep relying, and keep knowing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, shake us up spiritually out of the doldrums that so often Satan causes within our lives. We become spiritually blah. But you want us to be spiritually excited over the truth that Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we celebrated last week, is still alive and still coming again. May we leave this place as believers excited over that truth and live with excitement. And Heavenly Father, if there be anyone here in this place of worship in need of Jesus Christ as our Savior, as their Savior, Father, may they by faith right now, this moment, say, yes, Lord, I'm inviting you to be my Savior today as I confess and repent of my sins and trust you to save me. Hear our prayer, Heavenly Father, as you continue to spiritually work your miracles within our lives. In the name of our Savior we pray. And all believers join and said together, Amen.